You're listening to a Rogue Agents episode rebroadcast that the Longbox Crusade crew made for the other podcast network where we do a little work on Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. We encourage you to check out on Her Majesty's Secret Podcast and its feed for new episodes and additional content. And we hope you enjoy these older Rogue Agents episodes re-released here on the Longbox Crusade Network. The exciting, dangerous world of James Bond has arrived in Los Angeles. The Peterson Automotive Museum invites you to experience the cinematic legacy of over 30 iconic vehicles of James Bond in the new exhibit, Bond in Motion. This new Bond exhibition features the largest official collection of 007 vehicles in the United States, including the 1977 Lotus Esprit S1 Submarine and No Time to Die Aston Martin BB5. Plan your visit today at peterson.org backslash bond. That's P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N dot org backslash bond. Hi, this is Ibrahim Mustafa, writer and artist of James Bond Solstice and co-writer and artist of James Bond Origin. And you are listening to On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. Hello and welcome back to On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, Rogue Agents. On this episode, we're going to be talking about some BBC radio drama. We've specifically listened to the Live and Let Die episode. meet the hosts that are here with me today. I am, of course, Jared Albrecht, the art sale artist, and joining me is the usual stable of rogue agents, and I'll introduce them one by one, and they will just tell me what the most Bond-like thing is they've done since last recording, and just to mix it up and get crazy, Delvin, the dark web, silver hands, pop, pop, hiss, pimp, destro, Felix lighter, hot thing, what's up? <laughs> I just I had to go that through, one. <laughs> I had to go through the second hand to, to keep, <laughs> keep track of the nickname. I I don't have much going on. Uh, I don't know. Has James Bond ever celebrated a birthday? Mine's coming up. I'm trying to think if he ever celebrated a birthday in the films. I don't remember that he did. He celebrated a death in, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but but not 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 a birthday. Uh, so I, I I've celebrated some, Christmas twice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, I got some R and R coming up. Uh, that's that's the main thing. Going on uh, and spending money at a ridiculously lavishly expensive hotel uh, this coming up weekend uh, in celebration of my birthday. So, uh, according to my uh, notes, your birthday is not for another six days. Hold on, carry the one. That's correct. Yes. All right. So you just full of it. I'm not full of it. <laughs> I am going. <laughs> I am going uh, this weekend. Oh, okay. On a trip. I, I thought you weekend? were saying that the most Bond-like thing you did is no. you've had a birthday. And I was like, wait a minute. No, he has. I've known this guy for a long <laughs> no. time. <laughs> no, I, I, I have not. I couldn't get that one past you. No, right. I, I, I have not. That This is in the future. By the time this is sent out to the podcast universe, I will have done it. All right. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. All right. Let's check in with Pat Sampson, a.k.a. DJ Cristados. Pat, what's the most Bond-like thing you've done since last recording? You know, I'm like Delvin. I don't know if I've done anything really exciting like like that to say. So, hmm. hmm. I made a, yeah. Like, it, you uh, know what? The last bondiest thing I've done, I recorded an interview with Ibrahim Mustafa for one of his comic books. And we also got to talk about Solstice. And so right. we got to chat with him. So that was really cool. That was cool. Let's move on to Jason the Weasel Skull. All break. Jason, most fun like thing you've done since last recording. Hopefully your pipes and everything are fine at your house. 
Yeah, I had a birthday. <laughs> oh, for real? I did. I for real had a birthday. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the battle of the birthdays, the real ones, the fake ones. It's hard <laughs> to tell. I turned, turned 51 or young Roger Moore, as we like to say. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> young Roger Moore age. Good for you. That's yeah, right. yeah. I worked. I just worked. That's all right. And then I waited. I was like, my brother said he sent me something cool for my birthday. Never showed up. That's a lie. That's yeah, a lie. You sent me pictures of it. I did. Yeah, I did show <laughs> it up. It did show up late as heck. That was mm-hmm. crazy how late that showed up. Yeah, I think you put it best when you said you could have jogged it to my house. But I, I got the post <laughs> office guy I there. think I could have. I think I could have. And it was a Bond-like gift. I got Jason some sketch cards, some original sketch cards that this artist in Italy did of Dr. No, Bond, and Honey Rider. And man, that guy's a it does look really good. He's good. He's of course, good every time Jared gets me a gift, I got to pay like at least 50 bucks for a frame for it's it. A, it's a framing bill. I do it a double. Do I see him not? <laughs> I know about this gift giving. I know about it. I've done it the double several times. But, yeah, I think I think Jared has like a stock option thing going with Michaels. I think that's, that's what has to be going on. See Anyway, thank you. They were very nice. Well, no problem and happy birthday. And you know what? Speaking of gifts, I think it's time we give a gift to our listening audience. Because, you know, sometimes four rogue agents just isn't enough. So on this episode, we are going to officially welcome our official, officially official fifth rogue agent, permanent member of the squad. Welcome to the team, Mr. Alan Porter. Thank you. You just so got so fed up of me barging my way, way in here as a guest. You thought we're just not going to try anymore and just give him a permanent right. slot. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, he's got the codes. He knows how to get into the feeds. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you just, oh. just can't get rid of me now. So Get rid of him. No, I, I think about the time we all went out to Los Angeles for the vehicles episode and we all hung out and Alan was like, you know, I'm on your show a lot. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you are. Let's just make it official. So we're going to have Alan on, uh, hopefully our newly minted agents that were previously rookie agents, Delvin and Pat can help teach Alan a little bit about James Bond as he tries to kind of catch up. Yeah. I got a long way to go with the knowledge. (laughs) (laughs) Catch up to you guys. Yeah. 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 You know, I was the winner of the, the, the (laughs) really first time I've heard that. (laughs) So by the way, I, as Delvin clearly has nicknames to spare, Mm -hmm. I don't have a nickname. If I'm going to join the rogue, Mm. (laughs) Shouldn't I have a nickname mm. as well? That's right. Up until now, whenever he's been on, I just play that little Hey Porter. Hey Porter. Hey Porter. Sound clip from Johnny Cash. <laughs> <Whatever he's on. laughs> but we, we need a, a real nickname for him. Yeah. Pat, I'm going to give that. Uh, that's going to be your job. You can work on that. Oh, I can. Otherwise, I'd put it out there to listeners. Let's, let's put a. Why don't we do that? <laughs> I don't <laughs> trust our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, I'm not why not? it. Why not? Listeners, let's get in. I think that's just my n- nickname, Billable or Trustworthy. Or- <laughs> Whoever has the highest uh, Patreon contribution gets the nickname out of whatever he wants or she yeah. wants. Sure. Listeners, go ahead. Hit up our Twitter page at OHMS Pod and tell us what you think Alan's nickname for the show should be. I mean, Everybody should Delvin just give him one of his? Or I don't- <laughs> Yeah, he's got plenty to spare, apparently. So. <laughs> We're pretty happy to have you here, Alan. You do bring a lot of uh, bond and knowledge. You you fit with our vibe of silliness well, so this should be fun. Thank you, guys. I do appreciate it. Oh, no, we're happy to have you. Happy to have you. Especially whoever it was who picked up the tap for my gin and tonic in LA. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I think that was me, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was still a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a full squad. But wait, there's more. <laughs> You're not going to ask me what I did, the most James Bond thing I've done since last time, either. Go you ahead, then, Al. Get the full you, 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 you don't send me the link for the show. You don't ask me the questions. I'm feeling... Don't have a nickname. Come on. I don't have a nickname. <laughs> Al, are you really sure you want me here, Jared? You've only had one kill. you got to have two kills yes, to earn yeah. your double O's. Well, the second one's going to be a lot easier. I'll tell you that. All right. What do you, what do you got for your Bond-like things? I haven't seen you since L.A., so what you been doing Bond-like since then? Well, I've been moonlighting on other podcasts, so I just did an interview for World Gone Geek and the Bond A to Z, or A to Z, sorry, podcast, which will be on the Felix Leiter episode, so I think that's coming out soon, so that was cool. 
Folks, I want to welcome our special guest to this uh, episode. We're trying to bring in some more guests. A while ago on Twitter, we said, hey, anybody interested in guests on the show? And I got a pretty good list of them going here just off screen. And Age and I has been an early adopter to the podcast. He was one of our very first contributors when we were rookie agents and we just started. He's been with us all the all the steps of the way. And Age and I is, uh, is Joseph Iliff. So welcome to the show, Joseph. Thank you, everybody. Good to be on live with everybody. This is great. What we've noticed his big contribution over the years is he's big into the literary bond. We also thought this would be a good episode for Agent I because these BBC radio dramas are more radio dramas based around the literary works. So we get to have Agent I perhaps give us some insights while he's here. So, yeah, it's going to be a good, good time tonight. Now that we've got everybody introduced, let's get into our rapid fire round. Our bond question for this episode. Since we're going to be talking about radio dramas, it's very audio and it's a lot of fun. I think we're all going to have fun talking about that. The question for this episode is, what are some of your favorite voices in the James Bond films? Is there someone who has a cool voice or a unique way of saying things or something that you just like from the films? And we're going to start with Alan. Welcome to the show, Alan. Let's go. Ten seconds and counting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nine he seconds. He took mine. He took Countdown Jerry. <laughs> countdown Jerry. Now, which one? Is on, the it's the most recognizable voice in the whole of 25 movies, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I love Countdown Jerry. Now, I, I think he does his best work in Diamonds. Is that is that your favorite? Yeah, that, that's the one. Yes, yeah. No doubt, because like the whole thing is falling apart around him, and he's just and he's sitting in his chair. He's, he's got one job to do, and boy, yeah, is he going to do it! So. <laughs> I love it. Good pick, Alan. Let's go to Agent I, Joseph. You got a favorite voice from the Bond film franchise? The one that I feel is iconic is so early on, but it's hard to beat it. And it's when Professor Dent hears Doctor No yes. telling him why has this been done? Why has his men not been killed? I ordered this. I mean, you assume that Professor Dent and Doctor No have seen each other face to face. I mean, he is not even in the room. And that echoey voice just sounds yeah. so creepy. You know that Professor Dent is scared for his life. Whatever they did to that voice to modulate it and made it echo in that room, you could feel the tension just listening to that voice. And it's only a couple of lines. That's a really brief scene, but it sets up Dr. No for the whole rest of the movie. You don't want to hear that voice and be on the wrong side of it. Oh, it's a great choice. That one ran through my head, too. I mean, I think the first thing you said was like, sit down. And it's so commanding. Good pick, Agent I. Let's go to the Weasel Skull. Jason, favorite voice? Secret agent <laughs> on whose side? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Memorable, isn't it? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely is. Well, well done, Jason. And let's go to Pat. <laughs> DJ Cristados, what you got? Goldfinger. No, Mr. Bond, I expect Expert. you to die. Oh, yeah. Or, or whoever dubbed him yeah. in that movie. <laughs> whoever dubbed uh, Michael him. Collins. There, Michael Collins. He did a lot of the dub work, didn't he, Alan? Yeah, like, he did. A lot of it. I only know that because we just researched it for the Ranking the Bonds Goldfinger episode we recorded last week. So Nice. Nice. Yeah. Timely. Thank you, Pat. Not bad at all. That's, I mean, it's a famous line, Pat. Yeah, absolutely. Immediately. Yeah, right. that, that, I mean, I could pick a Bond guy too, you know, Sean Connery. All, you know, everybody tries to imitate his voice. So we've been known to try from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got away with it. <laughs> Let's go to Delvin. Favorite voice. The first thing I thought of was Christoph Waltz because. Every time that he had to deliver one of those soliloquies, like, you know, the whole vibe of the cuckoo, cuckoo, that was just, like, super, it was creepy, but it also made you want to pay attention to it. And I think that those two qualities would make him a pretty good radio voice if they were to ever cross over. Pat, did you have an addition? Czechoslovakia! There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. The guy who gave the greatest PowerPoint presentation in the history of PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> General Orloff. <laughs> then pouted like a like an angry child when he got <laughs> shot down. You know, it's probably going to come as a surprise to you guys that I'm going to pick Christopher Walken uh, <laughs> because he's happy as in the saddle. But if I'm not allowed to pick Walken as some parameters were given earlier, 
<laughs> then I might have to go uh, get a two for one special with Yafit Kodo in his Mr. Big voice and his regular voice. Like his regular voice is really just engaging. Like just the way he speaks is very, I don't know. I just like, I just, I just, I just like his dulcet tones. If I get, and then when he's Mr. Big names is for tombstones, baby. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. That's the, that's a great line. Take this out back and waste it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Mr. Big. Uh, I'm giving it to Yafit Kodo for two voices that I think are really good. And I mean, while we're in that movie, Baron Samity kind of famous for that mm-hmm. for that voice too. So, yeah. all right. Well, if you've got a favorite Bond voice that you'd like to chip in, of course you can head over to OHMS Pod on Twitter and let us know what's your favorite Bond voice. We had some good ones here tonight. I, I like that. I like that discussion quite a bit. All right, let's get to the main topic of this episode. We are going to be talking about Live and Let Die, as brought to you by BBC Radio Four. What do you see? I see travel. For who? I don't know. I I feel action and speed. What else? I see a fool. Who? Cannot be you. No. I see a winner riding fast victory good what more i see death live and let die by ian fleming dramatized by archie scottney starring toby stevens as james bond john standing rutina wesley josh stamberg Jonathan Cake, Levinsky Jean-Baptiste, James Morrison, Ron Cephas Jones as Quarrel, and Kevin Daniels as Mr. Big. Martin Jarvis is the voice of Ian Fleming. Quick history on Bond and Radio. The earliest Bond and Radio was a South African broadcast of Moonraker, and it starred Bob Holness as James Bond. Now, this one's interesting because there's no known surviving recording of it, and it's kind of a word of mouth thing. When I looked it up, it said people have said it was on air anywhere from 1955 to 1958. Even the year is questionable. I'm certain Alan doesn't have anything to add about this. Not one thing. <laughs> All right, Alan, I see you. What you got? So if, if you've read Mark Edlitt's book, The Many Lo- uh, Faces of James Bond, he has a whole chapter in this where Mark actually managed to find and track down the contract for Bob Holness signed for it so yes it did happen we know the exact date that it was recorded on mark also has a uh, an interview that was done with bob holness's daughter about the whole thing and a letter that bob holness wrote to a fan that actually gives some background information on it so yes it was a myth up until a couple of years ago but mark actually did some great work and actually proved that it actually did happen so yes it was moonraker 1953 with bob holness Bob Holmes was actually more famous in the UK as a game show host. Interesting, interesting. Now, you were saying 53. Yeah. Interesting, because, yeah, the stuff I was looking at, people were guessing anywhere from 55 to 58, but it went back to 53. That's interesting. I think so. I'm looking I'm looking down, trying to find the book. I'll give you time to come back to that. Okay. Thanks for that additional information, Alan. After that, Bond and Radio kind of disappears until about 1990. There's a guy named Michael Jason who does an official BBC uh, release of You Only Live Twice. Going back in time to the South Africa one, I want to say, and I'd be interested in Alan's update if he has something on this too, what I was reading was it wasn't necessarily licensed. It was like they just kind of did it. We'll let Alan get back to us on that as he's doing some research. You mean Agent Archive? Agent Archive, you're giving him a nickname. I, uh, I'm <laughs> testing it out. I'm no, testing, testing it the out. waters. I yeah. like Agent Archive. I like it. A for you know Alan and, and but, you Archive? know testing it out. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll kick it around. <laughs> we'll see how we dig it. Okay, I got it wrong. So the contract was 1958, not 53, and eight looks like a three. Does it say anything in there about anything official about Fleming or anything like that? Because again, my research said that it was sort of like a unlicensed they kind of just did it thing yeah they just kind of did it yeah okay 
Yeah. Interesting. Here we go. The Money Lives of James Bond by Mark Edlitz. Highly recommended it. There you go. Many lives of James Bond. Mark Edlitz helps solve our mystery right here on the episode. All right. So on this episode, we are going to dive into the BBC Radio drama from BBC Radio 4. This series started in 2008 to celebrate the 100 years since Fleming's birth. Toby Stevens takes over as the voice of James Bond. You may know him as Gustav Graves from the film Die Another Day. And interesting behind the scenes here, I went to a BBC site and they had a thing I could click on and it said, here's the chronological listing of the Bond radio shows. And then they were like, boom, number one, live and let die. I'm like, let's do it. Come to find out, it was actually the eighth one that they released in 2019. What they had done is put it in book order. And so I intended us to listen to them in order, but we're going to be listening to them in book order because I screwed up on the initial one and we're sticking with that formula. So uh, we're listening to them in book order while this is actually the eighth one they recorded in 2019. Now, around the room, had anybody dabbled in these BBC audio productions before? Delvin, we'll start with you. No, sir. I have not. All right, Pat, you ever mess around with the BBC radio shows? No, I didn't mess around with nobody. No. (laughs) Jason, did you touch it? (laughs) Jared, a gentleman doesn't answer those kind of <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, no, I did not. Agent I, you mess around with these radio shows? Yeah, I have heard some of that. Alan, radio shows? I put them to one side of my YouTube channel. As they came up on YouTube, I've been putting them in a playlist. But you know what? I had never got around to listening to them until you suggested doing this for the show. So... Thank you for getting me off my ass and actually listening to them. Awesome, awesome. That's half the fun of the Bond podcast. It makes us do some stuff that we might not have thought to do or been meaning to get to. So it sounds like our only real experience with the radio shows here is Agent I and myself. I've listened to three of them. So this was a re-listen for me. Agent I, had you listened to this one specifically? Did you listen to Live and Let Die? No, this is a new one for me, this one. Oh, okay. So first listen for everybody here but me. Well, let's get into it. As I mentioned previously, this is wholly based on the novel Live and Let Die. It is not based on the film. It is all radio drama. It's all done via sound effects, music, voice acting, and some narration. Now that we've got a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about, let's find out what the guys thought. We'll do two rounds of highs and lows, as we usually do. And we will start with Alan. You get to be the newest rogue agent. Round one, high, low, what the, what was your impression of this? I'm going to start with a high. I was really impressed by the way they adapted this story and kept the story intact and every, all the action and all the story beats and managed to completely avoid any of the unsavory, uncomfortable parts of the original novel. I think they did an amazing job on adapting it and making it work incredibly well without actually hitting any of the low notes that come with the racist, sexist, anti-American feelings, blah, blah, blah. Live and Let Die is the one book that I feel really uncomfortable reading now because it's very much of its time. And some of the language he uses and just the way the story is put together, it is really does not play well from today's perspective. And they managed to do this adaptation and completely avoid any of that, but still keep the story and all the story beats intact so i was really impressed with it with the adaptation itself very cool very cool all right moving around the horn agent i high low what the what you got a high for me was how they were able to take the emotion from the book like the, the live and let die the novel has has some very scary elements with the voodoo background and and the villain being someone who is all based on fear and intimidation the context of everything just has that quality when you read it that you're like, am am I safe? Am I okay? Am I alone right now? It takes that. And the radio drama was able to pick up on that and make you feel some of that. Like when you're reading it, that kind of like, this is scary, a little macabre, a little dark. And I got that feeling from the radio. I think they pulled that element in there really well. Excellent. Excellent observation. Yeah. I like, they did a lot of that just with good voice acting with those, drum beats and stuff like that. Yeah, I pick up exactly what you're talking about. Jason, the weasel skull, high, low, what the? I'm going to give it a high because it really evoked this kind of 
childhood emotion back from me. You know, when we were kids growing up, I think most of us are old enough to remember the days before VCRs and DVDs and Blu-rays and now streaming were prevalent. And you can watch anything, anytime you want. You know, these stories on cassette and stories on LP were the ways that I listened to some of my favorite films and books. And it really kind of just kind of evoked that for me, just that listening to the story and having my imagination play it out in my mind. I was kind of surprised at how that took me back and how much I really enjoyed that feeling. Oh, same here. Yeah. Of course, I lived in the same house with Jason. So we had like the Raiders of the Lost Ark audio record and the Star Wars one. And like Jason said, you know, with that or the comic adaptations was the only way to keep in touch with those things back then. We didn't even have VHS tapes. That wasn't a thing. So, yeah, I felt the same nostalgia, Jason. Uh, what about you, Pat? You got that nostalgia or uh, are you going to go a different high or low or what? The, what do you got? Uh, I'll carry on with that uh, nostalgia. And that's a good way of putting it, Jason, that it did remind me of listening to, you know, the 45s we had of, like you said, Jared Raiders and Star Wars. I still have mine and I miss listening to that and being able to listen to this. I was going to break it up in like three 30 minute chunks because I didn't know what to spec, but I ended up listening to longer parts of it longer because I was so brought into this story that was developing and not seeing the movie probably for, for a while since we've gone through with rookie agents, just all the different story elements that are in the novels that are taken and put into different movies. Uh, You know, I picked up on that. Did you? Yeah. Anymore. I I should have started taking notes on what was said just to see, did I catch all the nuggets that were pulled out and put into different movies and things like that? I really like that. And I think they did a really great job. It kept my interest, definitely. Very cool, very cool. Pat Delvin, you get to round out round one with your high, low, or what the on this audio drama. I'm with the gentleman on the same sentiment. The thing that I liked a lot about the entire thing was Of course, you know, it's radio, it's quote unquote old timey. But I think what it made me think about the most is how fun it would be to do like a radio recording. Like if someone drew up the script and they're like, they want you to do like this certain role. Like I I can't remember the gentleman's name who voiced James Bond, but somebody approaches you and they're like, yeah, we want you to play James Bond. It's like, it's a radio show. Like you want to do it? (laughs) Say less. Yes. Of course I want to do it. It's James Bond. This is going to be a heck of a lot of fun. So like the whole concept and idea of it is really cool. And any of the number of sound effects and the things that they did in the background to bring you a sense of realism about what's going on. It's definitely one of those where you it's probably best suited if I don't know you're sitting down and have no distractions and can just sit there and enjoy it and get lost into the literary world. I think that would be how you would have to enjoy this best. So the very idea and concept of it I really liked. Excellent. Yeah, I know I personally like I said, I've listened to three of them now. I love using them for long road trips. I just put it on when I'm driving a, a good distance and I, I listen to them that way and it and it takes me away. And next thing you know, I'm I'm driving the wrong way on a four lane. But you know, whatever. It's 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 all it's all part of part of the adventure. Um, I'm gonna add a quick high and, and then go around again. And I won't take anything too meaty because I want to leave plenty of things for you guys. But I just want to hone in on one voice that I particularly enjoy, and that was Felix Leiter. I really liked that one because they didn't fall into the trap that so many because this is a European production too, that you know, a lot of times the typical assumption of a Texan is a voice like this, you know, and they, they did a more realistic Texas accent, I think, than you would have gotten in a lot of ways. And Delvin and I have talked before because we've, we've talked with military friends from other countries and like other countries, when you say American, most people kind of think of Texan, like that's like (laughs) as American as it gets. And we even saw that in some of the Sherlock Holmes stuff that we've done before, whenever Americans come over into the Sherlock Holmes TV show from 54, they're almost inevitably from Texas. And so I just thought it was kind of cool that, that he had a real cool and memorable voice and it wasn't overly Texas. So that's well, the only thing I'm going to add in the round one. And there's another nickname for Alan, the Texan with the British accent. 
<laughs> this is called Texas Allen. <laughs> So just well, put just put Tex up there or something. Yeah, yeah. Like Brick, Brick Texas. Yeah. yeah. Texas T. You know what? Let's just call him Tex. All right, Tex. You can you can kick, <laughs> you can kick us off on round two with a high, low, or what the Well, since you're all asking. Um... <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> but like in the best way possible. <laughs> that was great. I'm actually gonna go with a slight negative. You mentioned the narration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I know why they did it. The voice of the guy who did it is Martin Jarvis. He's a really well-known actor in the UK. I recognize his voice. He's actually the director of this series as well. Yep. What I didn't like was the fact that they had him as the voice of Ian Fleming. I don't know why, but positioning the narrator as Fleming bugged me. And I don't know why. There's no real reason for it, but I don't know. It just took away from it for me. I wish they'd have just said the narrator or just not necessarily put a label on it. So I, I get what you're saying. When they announced someone as Ian Fleming, I'm like, really? Was Ian Fleming, <laughs> was Ian Fleming a part of the story? Did he write yeah, himself in there? Fleming's not part of the story. He's a, yeah, he, you know. Yeah. So, I don't know if Fleming is the omniscient narrator from a writing perspective, but just the fact that they labeled it that, I don't know why. It just, it just bugged me. Well, a follow-up question to that, and you and Age and I would be both good people to ask. When he is reading it, because it's been years since I've read, read these, is he reading direct quotes from the book? As far as I can remember, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think a fair amount of that was pretty close to the, the narrator in the novel. Okay. Like, yeah. I would give it a little wiggle room if he was reading directly from the book, but I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Like I said, very minor negative, but yeah. I had to search hard to try and find a negative, and that was the best <laughs> I could come up with. You really do. These are really, really quite entertaining. I'm glad you guys uh, are, are digging them. Hopefully, our listeners will, will go get them. And uh, when we get done with our, our highs and lows rounds, I'll let you listeners know where you can go find those uh, short versions on YouTube. All right, age and I. <laughs> well, speaking of Fleming, I, I like that they seem to resist the temptation to make the Bond character or, or the, the story more like the movie Bond or more like you would see in other aspects. I felt like they tried to tack it to the novel and the source material and part of that was probably because legally that's where they have the license from, is from the Fleming estate and the literary history of Bond rather than the movie rights, which are separate. So I think they did that partly literally, but they could have injected some things or hyped up things that would make it seem more like the Bond of the movies. And I felt like they made it dramatic, but stuck close enough to the source material that you could tell. This isn't the James Bond that you go to the theater to see. The characters from the novel were, were still in there in the radio drama. Yes, yes, indeed. They did stay quite loyal to that and, and still made it exciting and entertaining. Like you said, they didn't lean into cinematic Bond uh, at all. And uh, yeah, I thought they did a good job of, of that, in my opinion, anyway. Jason, what do you got? Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing as far as the literary Bond and kind of the differences between literary bond, uh, as you know, I've kind of fairly recently read my way through the Ian Fleming novels and spoiler alert, Live and Let Die is probably my favorite out of all of the novels that I've read, despite the troubling parts, as far as just action and fear factor and just creepiness, the, the environment and the vibe, having Felix Leiter get eaten up by that shark. It just, all the cool stuff is really really there. So I think that where I kind of landed for my second high is I think the voice acting was just really, really good. Because I was thinking, I really just read this. Do I really need to listen to it? And I'm really glad that I did because the voice acting, and I was thinking specifically of that scene where Bond is swimming towards the island. And without a whole bunch of narration, you just hear like his inner monologue and I'll just wrap it up by saying one of the cool things about literary Bond that you don't necessarily get so much with James Bond on screen, the literary Bond is full of vulnerabilities and he's flawed. He's a very flawed character. But the one thing that really stands out and has stood out so much in that scene in that novel is his will. It's just at the end of the day, he can just will himself to make that swim to the island. 
to take that beam towed over the coral until that bomb detonates. So he knows I just have to last. I just have to outlast. And that's the one thing that I really admired about him. And it really came out by Toby Stevens in this radio play. So big high for that for me. Definitely. Definitely. It's not about how hard you hit, Jason. It's about how hard you can get hit. And that's that's Bond. He can get it and keep moving forward. I'm crossing podcasts here. <laughs> Fat, DJ Cristados, what you think? Well, well that brings up Three things that I have. One, to go right off of what Jason said. Yeah, I know. Three things. <laughs> Deal with it. We're, I'm, I'm going rogue. Yeah, every, every episode. But what Jason said that will to just continue on and go on just made me think about this is Bond. And how many years? It keeps going on and keeps going on. The will to continue for Bond to continue to go on in comics, in literature, in movies and all that just that will is there throughout the bond universe that's very cool and so, uh, second thing is delvin talked about the sound and the editing and and just putting that audio drama together we do that with the lbc crew show with mysteries be it very simple and now I feel like, man, I really got to up my game for those things. <laughs> I just put some simple things in there. But, you know, just hats off to them, to that production. It's really, really cool to do. And, and just the little things that we do for the, the LBC crew show for the Minute Mysteries, man, they did this for like 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't solved one of those mysteries. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Me neither. And I put them together. Uh, but the other thing I want to say is what I liked is this is a different world when you read the novels compared to the movies, which is I like because now I'm getting a different side of Bond again. And it just brings me back into this, you know, world that I've learned to love and, and got into. So it's really cool to see that uh, not only in the comics but also in the books that we're reading and the audio drama. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's kind of cool to have Live and Let Die, the movie. I think Dynamite did a Live and Let Die comic. I, I believe I have the hardbacks in my shelf. Live and Let Die, the novel. Live and Let Die, the audio drama. Yeah. All based around the same thing, but there's such unique experiences, which yeah, I think you, is what you're getting at, Pat. Like, it's, yeah, it's like a, a, like a different world with a twist. Yep. You know, it, it's the characters I like. And that you've learned from the movies, as I said before, but now you see where the movies were pulling the different stuff from. And like, oh, that's really cool. And I like that. It's, it's a different world with a little twist. Yep. Yep. A lot of shaken, but not stirred. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> There's a lot of um, the literary live and let die in License to Kill, I've noticed. That, that one seems to have a lot of it yeah. in there. Which, uh, I don't know if you guys know, this is my favorite Bond movie. Would you guys like to talk? Never mind. Delvin, it's your turn, huh? <laughs> Lower what the... I also think that it's very important to note that about Live and Let Die, I didn't read it. Nice. <laughs> nice. So, thanks for bringing I, I that had, joke back. <laughs> yep, had that, had that sitting there waiting in, in the queue <laughs> for a while. Had to get that out. Okay, what I will mention about the radio cast, since I have not read Live and Let Die, the actual book. Of course, the comparison that I had was you know, the movie. So I, I wasn't impressed with Solitaire. Like the chemistry between her and Bond, it was not there for me. It was never really established. I was not convinced of their, their love affair. I was in the movie. I was not as far as the book go. Cause I'm like, okay, I understood because I, I I remember even making a comment about it when watching the movie that it was almost like Bond just forgot about the mission. It's like, I'm going to go save this very beautiful woman. Mission be damned. And Quarrel was the one who went around. <laughs> did all the legwork. <laughs> did all the legwork and <laughs> saved everything. But it, it at least kind of made sense because you can tell that Bond had completely fallen for solitaire. So I didn't buy the chemistry. I didn't buy that they just said that basically Solitaire was kind of a telepath. And it's like, really? In real life? You're going with telepath? That's the, ooh, okay. 
<laughs> I'll keep I'll keep going with it. it. It was those elements were kind of hard for me to buy from the literary perspective, like a tarot card reader who happened to be very prescient and good at what she does. I would actually buy that a lot more than them trying to explain it away by saying that she was a telepath in real life. That didn't quite fit the bill for me. Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to, I think something perhaps Jason mentioned earlier. Bond's f- more flawed in these, in the books. He's not as charming. He's not Roger Moore. <laughs> charming. Yeah. In the, in the books. Yeah. It's um, sometimes I you wonder why any was... woman would like him. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no healthy relationship in any of the books. I don't think the women in the books are just as damaged as he is, and that's why the relationships don't last. Jason, what's the one that uh, we read? Uh, and Bond was uh, tracking the guy through the jungle. And uh, are you talking the for your eyes only one, or because yeah, okay. That story, I mean, I at least understood at the end where not Melina, <laughs> what her name was in the book, okay, but yeah, yeah. I, Judy I un- thank you. I understood. I could get the chemistry there. It's like, okay, they just went through a life or death experience. It's like, okay, adrenaline's going. Let's hump. Okay, cool. I got that. That kind of makes sense. But the solitary thing was just kind of like, yeah, we saw each other. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything okay. missing? In the novel, did they say more? I mean, Good I guess that. Alan or, or Agent I, I. Not so much about the relationship. There's, they cut some of the physical descriptions of the two of them. Well, well, then maybe that's on the train and her coming on to him when he had a broken finger and him saying there were certain things he couldn't do because of his broken hand. Um, mm. I think they cut some of that stuff out. Yeah. So some of the, the more sort of sexually explicit descriptions of the relationship between the two of them was cut but i wouldn't have said any of that really impact i know what delvin means i never it was never really a relationship that i particularly understood even in the reading the novel it was just it just seemed to happen too quickly and too conveniently well and that's part of that bond is meeting these people you know on the job and part of getting a relationship with solitaire is in order to further the mission. Oh yeah. And, he's de- he's definitely so, fishing for information. Yes. In, I mean, I mean, he's using he yeah. her to get information about yeah. the mission of figure out what's going on with this organization and how it works and stuff. And I think up until the point where she is then kidnapped back by the enemy, a lot of it is just pursuing the mission. And then it's kind of like, I let her be now that I have to go rescue her because she's in danger again. And this time it's because of me. So I think you're right that it it tracks a little more that it should be a little bit more business-like than romantic, like we would see in the movie. So I think that's part of a a bit of that is the source material. And I would say it's one of the most superficial relationships. I mean, it's not like the Vesper Ling one or, Tiffany Case or, you know, uh, deeper relationships in the, and obviously Tracy and stuff. There are much deeper relationships in some of the other books. I think this is really one of the most superficial ones. So totally track with what you were saying, Delvin. Yeah. yeah it kind of goes back to what Jason was saying too. They're both damaged. Like, like Age and I was saying, he's using her for information. She's using him to get away. Like they're just using each other. <laughs> is what they're doing. <laughs> So, and and yeah. you branch off how that's in, uh, in the License to Kill movie, like with uh, Sanchez's girlfriend, right. who, again, he, he's using that to further his mission to figure out what's going on. She maybe takes it a little too far, like, we're just going to run away together and live together forever. And he's got a guy to go like, that's not how this works. That is an element of the novel bond that you don't see as much in the movies where, yes, we're on a mission together, but then we actually happen to have affection for each other outside of the plot of the movie and that doesn't happen as much in the novels this is also why i, I can't be a secret agent because if talisa soto was like let's run away together <laughs> then like the credits would have rolled that would have been it sanchez would have got away with everything the gasoline scheme felix would still be in the hospital wondering where i was ah it's a whole For other me, story. if it would have been solitaire going a man comes he has no chance <laughs> <laughs> may as well turn around and go home <laughs> I don't like the cut of his jib <laughs> alright well on that fun note that is the end of our highs and lows rounds 
Uh, I would like to give uh, any extra highs or lows uh, moment, especially to Agent Eyes, our special guest. Did you have anything else you wanted to bring out? Any tips, tricks, or any, anything else you wanted to add? I think the other thing, and, and Jason kind of mentioned that the Bond character is is different in the literary. He is much more introspective, and he's much more consumed with his own thoughts and his life and his place in the world than you think about movie Bond being. And a lot of people have talked about, oh, they should take one of the Fleming novels and really make the movie just like in the novel, like just take the novel and film it. And one of the things that I think is short-sighted in saying that is that so much of the good material in the novels is Bond's inner monologue. Bond is talking to himself and thinking about a situation, but in the outside, he's just standing there or sitting there. And so for a movie camera, it wouldn't be much unless you were going to do like a film noir where he was talking to the audience, saying all of these things. I mean, like the very first chapter of Casino Royale is basically Bond standing in the middle of a casino, just observing it and thinking about it, how it smells, how it sounds, how sweaty people are, how is someone rob it if they were going to rob it? I mean, like the whole first chapter of any Bond stuff anywhere is basically Bond standing by himself and just thinking in his head, what is the situation I'm in? And for a movie camera to film that, you wouldn't know any of that. So the radio drama helps with that introspection of his inner monologue as he's in danger. He's going to pursue this until the end. He's either going to win or die. This is the situation. You can do that in a radio drama and you can do that in the books and an audio recording. The movies would make that a really difficult element to include. And so this is a way, if you are interested in kind of like the bond behind the movie bond, this is a good way to get into some of that. That comment by Jason, I thought was really prescient. Please don't encourage Jason. I is smart. I is important. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, those are those are excellent insights, Agent I, and we appreciate you coming on this episode to share those with us. Like I said, uh, Agent I has been with us as our literary correspondent for the show for quite some time, so it's wonderful to get those things from him. Does anybody else have any burning highs or lows before we move on? I actually just want to pick up on what you said about the order of these. I don't understand the order that they release them. They're weird. <laughs> Because it doesn't follow the books at all. Like you said, I thought this was the first one. It's not. It's like. Not the, eighth or ninth. I eighth wrote it. Ninth, it's eight. It's eight. 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 eight out of nine. They started with Dr. No, which, okay, the movie started with Dr. No. I can sort of see that. So they went Dr. No, Goldfinger, and then From Russia with Love. Yeah. And then Majesties and then Dim- Diamonds. I don't know. It's all over the place. I don't, all, yeah. I don't see any logic to the what they put out when they put out. So. Well, it definitely duped me because when I saw the chronological list, I was like, oh, let's do these in order, yeah. you know? And I, yeah. I was like, oh, they released my book order. And I noticed they didn't do Casino, but I thought, well, they started in 08. That was really close to Casino's release. Yeah, so they're probably right. leaving Casino alone for a while. W- but then it they, makes no sense. It makes no sense. No, <laughs> would they sense. have maybe done it just in a popularity order, maybe? Uh, you know, these are, if we're going to do it and we only... I mean, like you said, I get starting with Dr. No because fans of the film franchise, that's where they start. You know, I get that. But if you're most popular, I think you'd have done, you'd have started with Goldfinger, maybe. Goldfinger, yeah. 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 I assume it was on the production side that they figured these were the order that they could make them in based on the voices they had to have and the sound effects and the the things Mm -hmm. like that, which to some degree makes sense that, like, why was Dr. No maybe the first movie done? Because it was the cheapest one to film. (laughs) <laughs> in that you basically go to Jamaica and film everything there in one one location and everything else is is a set. And so you can do the whole movie for a million dollars, whereas some of the other novels that had been made by that time would have been more expensive to make. And so I think that was part of why Dr. No is the first movie. It may be something of the same line that they could make them at this sequence but they could have released them in a different sequence, I guess, from from making them. But well, yeah, and they've been released like in one and two year gaps. We haven't had one for a couple of years now. Yeah. They seem to be like two year gaps. So I don't. And it might have been down to Toby Stevens and other people's availability, how far in advance they cast them, and when they were available and stuff. I don't know. It just seems a weird order. So I'm glad you're actually forcing some sort of sensible order on us 
Jared would <laughs> listen to them in, pure in, in, in novel order. That, yeah. that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait till they get to the novelization of Die Another Day, and Toby Stevens is going to square off against Toby Stevens. Toby Stevens. <laughs> 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 <So>. <laughs> Just a question for, again, Alan and, and Age and I who are smart on this. One thing I picked up in Live and Let Die is they're in Jamaica and Strangways is there. And like, I only know Strangways from, from Dr. No, but I'm like, well, I think this book came before Dr. No. So, yeah. yes, so he, he's actually a repeating character in the yes. novel. Yeah, yeah, he's in two of them. Yeah. It's the same with Quarrel as well. That's why. Uh, and Quarrel. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things. One of the reasons why he goes out in Dr. No is that he actually has a relationship with Strangways. In the novel, but in the movie, of course, since it's the first one, he, he doesn't already have that. So, Poor Strangways didn't last long. Well, folks, it's now time to get into the ratings. On this show, we rate these things on a scale of one to seven martinis. Seven martinis means it shook your martini. You loved it. It was awesome. Six means it was very good. Five means it was pretty good. And four means it was good. Three was, eh, was okay. And two was... Eh. And one, I did not like it. It stirred your martini. That's just gross. So let's go around the room. Jason, the Weasel Skull, I'll let you start one to seven. How'd you feel about these radio shows? I'm going to give this one a solid six. I liked it a lot better than I thought it was. I would. I thought it was going to be a little bit redundant, but it brought out some uh, nostalgic feelings. The only reason why I don't give it a seven is I think they cut out some of the action from a couple of the scenes, and I was having a, a little bit of a hard time trying to figure out what was going on. Like when he makes his escape, his initial escape from the clutches of Katanga's men. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I was like, I seem to remember this playing out a little differently. And then also I thought there was more to the underwater swimming than I recalled. I could be mistaken on that. I thought they cut out a couple things that I would have preferred them to leave in. So six for me. All right. Pat, one to seven. I put Jason at a six. I was really entertained. I think I might want to go back and listen to some more audio dramas of the books. So I'm really digging this kind of format and plus reading it too. So I, I want to go back and read or listen to the ones we've read already. Cool. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, I definitely would like to. You know, if I had an unlimited time, like to do a reread, like read the book and then listen to the audio book, like immediately thereafter, that'd be kind of a fun one to punch. But Delvin, what do you think? One to seven on your first foray into the radio drama, James Bond. What do you think? I'm going to rate it, Jared. Uh, my spider says for Delvin says he'll never give a seven to the first thing he tries. So it's either a five or a six for you. Pat's on it. It's a five. And I thought about that. I, my initial was a cautious four and I went up to a five largely because I had a lot of the same sentiments that all the other gentlemen have. I like it. I like the idea of it. I think it's a very good idea. I need to get myself in a better position because I did it. I was listening to it mostly while I was working today. And that's not the place I needed to be. I needed to be just sitting there, like maybe just put the phone away and just sitting there and just listening and getting into a good mindset if I can make the time to do that or, or just go on a nice long walk or something or take it on a drive. That would have been a much better venue for it. So I like the idea overall and I like the idea that it's going to give me a chance to ingest a little bit more of the literary bond that I haven't before. It's all great concepts. So I'm at a five. Very cool. Very cool. I have the two follow-ups on that. Number one, like I said, I listened to it. I was driving. And the second time I listened to it, I did do it on walks. I did two 45-minute walks. And that's I listened while I walked. And then I had this mental image of you at work, like holding a stapler, like it's a PPK, kind of peeking around corners and looking into people's cubicles. And they're like, Delvin, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm the dark web. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. I'm a secret agent. <laughs> Rolling around in your chair. And there's all kinds of like, just doing Bond stuff. All right, one to seven. Agent I, what do you think? I would give it a solid six. There's very little of it that I could tweak or would do better or, or I thought would have added an element. I think it's pretty much enjoyable and uh, and true to the spirit of the source material pretty much throughout. So I give it a six. Excellent. And we'll bring it home with our newest, newly minted rogue agent, Tex Porter. What do you <laughs> Still feeling that one out, but I like it. I'm going with the rest of the guys on a solid six. The reason it's not given a seven, same reason Delvin rarely gives the top mark is 
I know we've got other ones of these to listen to. There might be one of the others that comes out a bit better. Looking forward to the one with Joanna Lumley in it. Um, <laughs> oh, um, Alan. <laughs> so on the basis that I imagine Secret Service is going to be a seven, I'm going to, without having actually listened to it, I'm going to give this one a six. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. And yeah, I, I'm really, really, really tempted to give a seven just because like Jason mentioned at the top of the show, I'm really taken with radio plays. Like I have a ton of the Basil Rathbone Holmes's on my phone. I have a ton of, maybe you guys know this, maybe you don't. There's Blue Beetle radio shows from like the 40s. I have a ton of those on my phone. I have Vincent Price's Price of Fear series on my phone. These are the things I listen to. So I really, really, really want to give it a seven just because I enjoy the experience so much. But I'm going to rein it in. I'm going to land on a six. And as we listen to more, maybe that barometer will change. I, I reserve the right to come back and say this is a seven at some, at some point, depending on what we what we listen to. So it sounds to me like everybody here would be willing to do another one and, and maybe even excited to do another one. And I'm seeing lots of head nods on our screen right now. So, so that's good. And if you listeners out there want to get in on this, as I mentioned earlier, as has been mentioned a couple of times, they're all on YouTube. They're super easy to find. BBC has been uh, pretty good about just letting them be out there. So you can go to a YouTube playlist and just type in BBC radio drama, James Bond. You will find a playlist. They're all there, easy for you to listen to. They're all 90 minutes-ish. As far as I know, all the ones I've looked at are 90 minutes. Ah, we've had a good time talking about these radio shows. Go check those radio shows out on those internets. And speaking of being out on the internets, let's do a little bit of a round the room of where people can find us on the internet if they want to chat more with us about this kind of stuff. Agent I, you're our special guest. Go ahead and tell people where you can be found. I'm available on the Twitter and on the Instagram at Seek Out Wisdom. That's at Seek Out Wisdom on Twitter and Instagram. Excellent. Let's go around the horn. Delvin, where can people find you? On Twitter at D-E-E underscore R-A-Y 1977. Pat, where can people find you, sir? Well, Jared, I'm glad you asked. You can find me on the Twitter at Christatos01. Weasel Skull. Well, Jared, I'm glad you asked. You can find me at Weasel Skull. On Twitter, and Jason Albrick on Facebook and Instagram. Mr. Alan Porter. You can find me on Twitter at Bond Lexicon, on Instagram at James Bond Lexicon, and don't forget the James Bond Lexicon companion website, jamesbondlexicon.online. And I am at Yard Sale Artist, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's all at Yard Sale Artist. You can check out my book page sketches at theyardsaleartist.com. And I do have a James Bond series if that excites you. Uh, before we wrap all this up, though, if you're interested in this crew and you maybe want to hear us talking about, I don't know, comic books, uh, video games, old TV shows, things like that, we're on another network. Pat, would you mind talking about that, sir? Well, Jared, I'm glad you asked. You can find us on the Longbox Crusade. That's at www.longboxcrusade.com. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So go and check it out. If you like radio dramas, we do have one of our podcasts that we do is called LBC Crew Show, where we do minute mysteries, and we ask you to solve the mystery. Delvin is the professor that tries to solve them himself. Lots of fun we have there. So go ahead and check it out. That's all at longboxcrusade.com. Never solved one of those. Well, that's it for us here at OHMS Pod. I want to thank Agent I for being here. I want to welcome Alan Tex Porter to the show. And you know what? On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast will return. And our next episode will be Pat's Choice. So we'll see what Pat has for us next time. This episode features the James Bond GoldenEye 007 Trap Remix by The Widdler. <laughs> <laughs>